All right, hi everyone. So welcome to this talk. Um, this talk is about, um, well, it's called the $1 billion for open source maintainers. And it's not only $1 billion as like uh, one lump sum um, once. It's literally that kind of money per year, right? And that sounds like a crazy number. It sounds like a lot. And, you know, the real question is like, is it really a lot of money? All right, so my name is Toby Langel. I'm a jazz drummer turned open source developer turned consultant. Um, I run a small consulting firm called Unlock Open, where I help organizations with everything related to standards and open source strategy. Um, and I've been into this question of sustainability and supply chain security like a long time before all of the recent events and uh, the CRA and all of that stuff. Um, and so I'm, I'm here to make uh, the argument today that we need a pretty big mindset shift about how we think about open, open source and open source maintenance. And for this, I'm going to look at three things. First, I'm going to look at money. Uh, I mean, title of the, of the talk kind of like gave that away. Um, secondly, I'm going to make the argument that maintenance isn't innovation and that we need to start splitting the two, thinking about the two things differently. Um, then I'm going to make the case that we actually have to professionalize maintenance. Um, I am not going to say who needs to, who's going to pay for this. So for those of you who ask, like, can we get the money on the way out or is my bag here full of, of cash? It's not. I don't have like really good answers for this, right? I don't have answers at all, actually, not even bad ones. Um, and then lastly, I just want to point this out, like, I'm not suggesting that paying maintainers is going to be the silver bullet that works for every project. Um, I think it's an option that's reasonable for a number of them. Like if your specific project differs, if your community structure is different and wouldn't work with this, that's perfectly fine, right? Like we don't need to all do the same things. All right, chapter one, money. Uh, so, you know, I said a billion, a billion dollar a year sounds like a crazy huge amount, but really is it. Um, and so I suggest we just do the math. Does anyone know here how many developers there are in the world, roughly? 20 to 30, 20 to 30 million, that's a number I've heard also. Any other guesses? So there's lots of different data depending on what exactly you look at. Um, I picked one number, uh, which is uh, the number of pro developers. The 20 to 30 uh, includes a bunch of people who are hobbyists or part-time developers. Um, so, you know, that's a number that works. It's, we're doing back of the envelope math anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, same question here, and you have a sense of what the average um, dev salary worldwide is. I mean, we all know that there are huge discrepancies between countries, et cetera. Um, I found some data that says this, right? Um, and this is for actually like net salaries. If you start thinking about loaded salaries was all of like employer tax and like computers and office space and whatnot. You can easily double that number, um, but this gives you a, you know, a, a good idea, right? Um, so what does 16 million times uh, $65,000 per year actually give you? Oh, am I going too fast? Am I missing a slide? Oh, it says so right here. See? All right, so it, one trillion, right? So it's kind of crazy, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot. It's a huge amount of money. Um, I had a, a previous talk when I was talking about sustainability where I actually showed like how big of a stack of $100 bills a trillion dollar is. And it's a skyscraper of $100 bills. Right? It's a huge amount of money. Um, and, and now if we look at 0.1% of a trillion dollar, well, that is a billion dollar, right? So we're talking about a billion dollars is actually 0.1% of the money that is spent yearly on software developers, being very conservative in how we count. So this is a trillion dollar. Every one of those little uh, purplish um, boxes is one billion, right? So when we talk about one billion dollar for open source, we're talking about this little guy over here. Right? 
you've probably all of you seen that number, which is, uh, and again, there are different numbers, sort of like how much of the stack is open source, how much of the code is actually open source. And it's roughly between three quarters and 80%, depending on like what exactly you look at, et cetera, right? But it gives you an idea, again, of the, the, um, um, the size and the magnitude of our dependence on open source. And so, you know, if you put these two things side by side, right, you look at, well, you know, on the, on the right here, here's like the amount of code that is, that we rely on that is open source and every application stack. And on the left, you have this tiny amount of money that we think is crazy to ask for. I'm not even saying we're getting this because we're not at all, right? But this sounds like there's something weird going on here, right? And so, you know, I'm asking this question now that you've sort of like looked at those numbers. And, you know, you, you can argue that uh, maybe you're comparing slightly apples with oranges, et cetera. Like I've seen some, some faces going in that direction, which is arguable, right? You can dig into it more. Um, but like, this is roughly what you're looking at. This like massive discrepancy between um, the usage of open source um, and the money that it's spent on maintaining it. Which leads me to the second point of this talk, which is about maintenance. So one of the things that I hear some of you, maybe all of you think when we start talking about paying for maintenance, it's like money will kill open source. And I've argued for that point myself for years, right? And, and I'm not the only one who has done this. Um, there was a quote that I think is interesting by DHH, the founder of Ruby on Rails. Um, that talks about this in his essay, The Perils of Mixing Open Source and Money. Um, and I know DHH is uh, uh, somewhat of a uh, contentious figure, uh, but, but I think that text isn't. Um, and I think it's interesting and just worth reading for what it is. Um, and so he says, essentially, that one of the benefits of open source is the fact that um, people come together to um, create solutions for actual problems that they have um, is really something that is um, essentially a huge innovation engine. This is how you get really high quality software. And you know, one of the ways you could look at this is if you compare it with um, enterprise software, uh, where there's uh, this um, um, you know, discrepancy between who's gonna be using it uh, and, and who's making, uh, who's purchasing it. With open source, you really don't have this, and you have this ability for everyone to just come together and work on finding solutions. Um, and one of his points is the fact that it's lean forces you to find lean solutions and not build new features, et cetera. And so, you know, I, I think we can say, and, and I think it's, it's uh, like one of the real value of open source is it's this huge innovation engine, right? It's an incredible innovation engine. But, and I think this is critical, maintenance is not innovation. These two things are entirely different. And so we have this kind of really odd situation today, um, which I, I think this sums up pretty well, right? It's, you have open source software, people are struggling to maintain it. Um, you now are starting to get like small bounties of, of funds or um, um, of, of different kinds, uh, sponsorships, et cetera. Um, but these are really focused on new features, right? It's like, oh, you know, you, you're gonna get like 10K if you build this additional feature. And the maintainers are in this really odd position where they actually need money to be able to continue doing their work. And again, I'm not talking about every open source maintainer, different communities are different, et cetera, right? Um, but to be able to get that money, they actually have to deliver new features, not work on maintenance. So they're actually not getting paid for maintenance. They're funding maintenance uh, through uh, getting paid for innovation, right? Which, which is kind of like completely upside down thinking. 
And so, you know, as an industry in general, I, I believe we, we, we really suffer from uh, featureitis or, you know, shiny object syndrome, uh, whose acronym is actually pretty funny. Um, uh, and, and so, so I think it's not only an open source problem. I think it's a, it's a you know, tech industry problem and probably broader, uh, but I don't, you know, I'm not familiar with what's happening elsewhere. Uh, but we really tend to value like the new and shiny and we like rarely want to fund like uh, everything that's supporting this. Um, and so one of the ways that I'm, I'm starting to think about separating um, the development and the maintenance is to think about project life cycle. I think that's actually super helpful. Um, so when you're thinking about project life cycle, um, essentially you have these sort of like four uh, times, right? Uh, which is you have like the, um, sort of, you know, the, the beginning, uh, usually like uh, one or two people building something. Then there is like a period of growth. Uh, then there is a period of stability as more and more um, other projects and organizations start depending on that um, project. And oftentimes, uh, you know, as time uh, go goes by, you start to have a sunsetting period where either um, the, the project um, essentially gets abandoned or really gets frozen, a uh, feature frozen. What's interesting is when you start thinking about development and maintenance in that context. And again, um, oftentimes you'll find the same people doing both but they remain two distinct activities. Um, and you will see that as a project matures, there is a shift between innovative development and more of maintenance work. And it's interesting because it matches a number of things that we take for granted um, in how projects work. For example, governance. Um, innovation phases are very often driven by a few people. And this is where we have the BDFL model from. And as they grow and as more and more organizations become dependent on them, you start to move to more open governance models. If you're familiar with worldly mapping, which if you're not, you should, it's great. Um, 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 Simon Wardley talks a lot about um, sort of like the four stages of development of any kind of like um, product um, and um, um, a component rather. Um, he talks about the genesis, um, custom built solutions, products, and then commodities, right? And again, as you move through that cycle, um, you're seeing the same difference between um, the innovative development and maintenance. And it's interesting because um, Simon Wardley also talks about what kind of uh, practice are good for each of those. And he says that, you know, like, Agile makes a lot of sense when you an in early innovative mode, but doesn't for something that's super stable, right? And of course, uh, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not suggesting anyone start doing Six Sigma with open source software, just to be clear, right? But like, it, if you st if you see those practices not as a competition of like what practice is the right one, uh, but like tools for the job and picking the right tool for the right job, uh, it starts to make sense, right? Um, when you're building products like Lean, makes more sense than Agile. Uh, when you have like a really stable commoditized component, then something like Six Sigma um, for hardware, for example, absolutely makes sense. It would be absurd if you were building nuts and bolts using Agile methodology. It wouldn't make any sense, right? Um, he also talks about pioneers, settlers, and town planners. Same kind of idea, right? The different people with different... Um, um, mental models and, and um, um, centers of interest will sort of lean towards different aspects of the software life cycle. Another one that we don't talk a lot about, which I actually really care about, um, is the move from craftspersonship to industrialization. Um, a lot of open source development at first is really a craft. Like people are honing their tools. They're working on dev tools a lot of the time. They really care about the crafts aspect of what they do. And you know, once you're talking about like a project that's used by multi-billion dollar organizations across the world, uh, it's industrialization, right? And you start having separation of like lots of you know different skill set within the organization, et cetera. 
Of course, that's going to matter. That's going to you're going to see the same thing with hard skills and soft skills. Um, um, the the more you move into the the life cycle, the more you're moving into. You need soft skills to get people to work together, to agree on stuff, to drive consensus, etc. Um, you're going to move from a maker's schedule to a manager's schedule. For those who are familiar with this, so you all, all have all of this kind of like you know different trends that we see um, that kind of match this life cycle and that that sort of spell out that there is a movement in the, in the development of, a, of software, of open source software, um, that moves from uh, the open source way, the early innovation phases, to something else that we don't really have defined yet and that we don't really practice as an industry and as a community. And so essentially what I'm, I'm making the argument that that is essentially professionalizing maintenance, right? So, so, and like how exactly we do this, I'm going to start throwing a few ideas out. Um, but we right now essentially don't have, um, you know, the, the, the same successful thing that we have for innovation. We don't have for maintenance. So, um, you know, this is how we think about open source today, right? We kind of think that nothing is funded um, and that we have these volunteer dev maintainers, these unicorns here that are doing all the things. In practice, that's entirely not true, right? We have a whole bunch of different things that are funded already. Um, I mean, <laughs> look at this place, right? Like, it, you know, it's not, it's not being volunteered by someone. Um, it's funded, right? We have folks that are working in uh, legal, you know, events, marketing, community management, uh, research, policy, infrastructure, etc., right? That are on payroll, um, either of uh, you know specific organizations, um, uh, dedicated organizations, etc., right? And we have security people that are kind of like in the middle right now, moving towards getting paid increasingly as uh, you know supply chain attacks become increasingly a thing too. Um, and so I, I think it really helps here to have this mindset shift between uh, the maintainer and the developer, right? Because having this mindset shift, like shifting the two things, kind of lets us uh, have our cake and eat it too, right? Because we can kind of shift what's funded to include maintainers. Um, and so we, we keep the um, uh, volunteer-driven innovation aspects of open source. But we essentially loop in, bring into the funded side of the world um, the maintenance of open source software. This is also a number that I think is worth thinking about. Right? If we had one billion um, a year, we could hire full-time 10,000 engineers to do maintenance. I'm, I'm not suggesting we do exactly this, of course, but you know, again, this is just an idea of like the scope of things. Um, so the question now becomes how exactly do we do this? So when you start, you start when, when, when you want to hire people or you want to have people work part-time or full-time, you have to think about legal entities actually hiring those people. <clears throat> um, so, you know, one of the ways that we could look at this would be existing open source foundations. Um, there are legal issues uh, in some jurisdictions uh, about um, people contributing to code in a nonprofit. Uh, so th there are, you have to be very specific about what you do, and it might not always be possible, but it's definitely something that could be discussed. Um, another option is existing fiscal hosts um, and uh, funding platforms, whether that's Open Collective or, or something else, right? So we already have kind of infrastructure to enable this. We could imagine new entities uh, focused on maintenance, sort of like maintainer pods. Um, that would be, um, I'll get into this a little more, right? Um, the um, CRA introduces, uh, so the Cyber Resil Resilience Act in Europe, um, which is um, uh, upcoming legislation that is um, essentially regulating the, um, the uh, software supply chain in general, um, uh, creates, has created this new notion of open source stewards, which is kind of an open source foundation. 
Um, and it kind of leans into this idea of that they're there to support the maintenance of, of open source software. So there is something to think there too. Um, so, you know, how could this work in practice? You can imagine private and public funding essentially uh, being funneled into FOSS foundations, fiscal hosts, new maintainer organizations um, of different natures, right? That could leverage payroll companies to hire maintainers. That could be focused on maintenance of um, either one project or group of project, um, depending on the case, or um, of uh, hosted projects at a foundation. So why is this really um, uh, interesting, right? It's interesting because you could start to think about maintenance the same way we think about DevOps or about um, uh, UX engineering, et cetera, right? Um, in terms of um, sort of like segments of our industry, right? Um, we could de develop dedicated practices in a much more clear way if we start to think about this is maintenance, right? Like this you know, clearly labeled thing. Um, we could imagine to have training uh, for maintainers that it would include security aspects. Um, we could also imagine that we would have proper management and career path uh, for those that care about this, right? We see a lot of burnout um, in, among, among maintainers that are overworked, etc. I mean, uh, this is exactly the kind of things that proper management and, and, and proper career path are designed somewhat to solve. Um, you could imagine having fractional developers um, that could work on many small projects, right? You could be, uh, you know, the maintainer for um, five or 10 or 20 different JavaScript projects that have all to do with, I don't know, uh, HTTP, right? Um, and you could start sharing resources across projects, right? Why is every open source project or every foundation kind of building their own stack? Um, it doesn't always make sense to do so. Um, the focus of maintenance um, would be sort of like really, um, you know, kind of like strictly defined to focus on security and support and training, tooling and infrastructure, which we already see a, a substan substantial amount of, uh, bug triaging, release engineering, um, documentation, and compliance, right? Compliance is going to be increasingly a big issue. Uh, that's also something that maintainers absolutely don't want to do, don't have the time to do, don't want to take the responsibility and liability to do. Benefits for maintainers, right? Well, of course, I mean, you know, they could get paid, which for those who are not, that's kind of you know, a, a nice kind of benefit. Um, but more seriously, I think it would give part-time opportunities for people to work. Um, this is um, uh, more common in Europe than it is in the U.S. as a concept. Um, but um, I think a, a lot of folks who are doing open source uh, and who aren't doing open source uh, for larger corporations um, are, um, are more of like the, like the craftspersonship kind of role and the less into the industrialization of, the sof of software um, and having the ability to uh, essentially work on open source on your own time but have a part-time job in a related field um, that is uh, properly paid could be really interesting to a lot of us, frankly. Um, proper management support, I mentioned that before. Healthcare, I mean, uh, you know, in some countries that does come with having a, uh, an employment. Um, again, better separation between work and play. And, you know, to sort of like um, loop back to the um, uh, features, uh, uh, you know, uh, 14 features and get paid for an additional features model that we have right now, this really would fund, as I was saying, a model, a model the opposite way, right? You get paid for maintenance, and if you want to work on open source as a volunteer, you can entirely do this. And then I'd like to say that we actually know that this model works. Right? There is a living example of this model that's been going on for like four or five years at this point, uh, which is Open Web Docs. So I don't know who's familiar with Open Web Docs here. Um, essentially, what Open Web Docs is, uh, is um, um, originally uh, MDN, uh, the Mozilla, Mozilla Developer Network, the documentation of NDM, um, uh, 
four or five years ago, um, uh, Mozilla uh, stopped funding the team that was um, doing this uh, full time, maintaining the infrastructure, writing some of the documentation, etc. Um, and a number of organizations um, banded together uh, to continue supporting that team. Um, and they've built a uh, structure on Open Collective, uh, have hired most of the existing team, um, uh, and are paying them um, through um, a payroll company. Um, was money coming um, from both private funding, um, so you know Canva, Coral, Facebook, Google, Egalia, Microsoft, and public funding through the Sovereign Tax Fund. So this is one example, and it's not exactly open source. I mean, it's really, really adjacent. Right? Um, but it works, and it's been working for a number of years. So to recap, $1 billion is actually pocket change when you look at the bigger picture. Right? And I think we really have to um, get this um, notion, like uh, you know, believe in this more as a community. Um, we really need to start thinking about developers and maintainers as two different things that uh, are happen at different times in the life cycle of a project. I think that's really helpful as a, a framework to think about the problem. Um, and I really believe that we can shape a better uh, future for open source projects and for maintainers by thinking, by separating these two things and by um, trying to figure out a solution for maintenance. Um, as I said, uh, we still need to figure out how to pay for this. I b increasingly believe that was, um, um, governments paying more attention to software supply chain and uh, starting to understand better the magnitude of the, um, their dependence on open source, uh, there is going to be some avenues through public uh, funding. So increasingly, I believe that that's going to be part of the solution. There are some really interesting uh, projects that are coming on, like the Open Source Pledge, uh, that um, I think is a great, uh, great idea, right? To uh, it's funny that we um, arrived on similar numbers, right? The open source pledge actually says that every organization um, should uh, that makes the pledge should uh, spend two thousand dollars per uh, developer that they have, and it's you get roughly to the same numbers. Um, and uh, well, actually, no. What am I saying? I, I did the math for this. Yeah. yeah. So I did the math for this. This is really interesting. If every company in the world um, paid, no, sorry, I did. The, yeah, I'm, I'm going to remember it. If every company in the world that is employing developers, well, we can it was the 16 million, right? 16 yes. million employed developers. Yes. Times two thousand dollars per each of those developers. Right. That'd be 32 billion. Yes, that's the number. That right. Book? Yes. Yeah. And so, like, um, yeah, essentially. Actually, so, to get to your 1 billion. To get to 1 billion, I think you need $65 per company, per engineer, per, per engineer, per year. Yeah. Right. $65 per engineer per year gets you, well, yeah, that's just, that's just a pure logical math, yeah, right? right? Uh, it, it gets you to 1 billion. Um, uh, and you would only need 3% of uh, companies employing engineers. Well, uh, I mean, given they all had the same number of engineers, blah, 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 right? But 3% to actually get to 1 billion was a 2,000 a year pledge, right? So when you look at those numbers, like they're very, very tiny. Um, so I, I think a combination of like um, something like this uh, and you know, a bunch of other initiatives will get us to there at some point. Um, and that's all I have. And um, thank you for your time. I'm happy to take, we have like plenty of time to take, to take questions um, and let my voice uh, rest a bit um, because I'm actually giving the next talk in the same room after this. I just found out about that. So I hope you enjoyed this and you can stay or if you didn't, you know that you have to leave like after this talk. All right, thank you very much. So that's a good question. Um, it depends what you count and how you count it. Um, so there is money that goes to foundations. Um, and we have, I mean, it's easy to compute. You're talking about about half a billion, roughly, 
um, the Linux Foundation taking the lion's share of it. Um, so that's one aspect, um, but it's not going to maintainers, right? It's going to all of the rest of the infrastructure that I talked about before, like events and, and you know, support and adv advocacy and, and all of that, right? Um, the second thing that you have, of course, and that has to be accounted for is all of the organizations that contribute um, people actually building software, right? That's pretty big. Um, that's, I don't know that we have good numbers for this, um, but that's a sizable amount. But that is the innovation aspect, right? It's not, or, I mean, it is, it like crosses both uh, by, by virtue of like, you know, no one's paying for maintainers. So obviously it kind of does both, but it's really about innovation. And, and my strong, you know, strongly held belief at this point is that it, um, it should be focused on innovation, right? I don't have a good number for this. Um, and then the last bit is kind of like the money that's flowing through Open Collective and, and things like this, and that is pocket change, right? You're talking about probably under 10 million uh, a year if, if uh, you know, give or take, right? Um, so a lot goes for the supporting infrastructure. I think a lot more into actual innovation, but I don't have a number for this. It's hard to estimate. Um, and then like a tiny sliver for maintenance through sort of like uh, open collective and, and, and friends. Please. Yeah, I just wanted to go back. You had a diagram that sort of showed money flowing through. Um, it seems to no. me that... Sorry. Um, this one. Um, that, you know, when a project reaches maturity, the innovation in the project itself probably has reached the plateau. I believe so, yes. But after that, all the innovation happens in integration. It's the people that take the product, whatever it is, for sure. and yeah. use it to yeah. do something with it. Absolutely. Who you know, need the thing to be stable, but actually don't need new At, features. A a hun like 100%. That yeah. If you look at uh, worldly mapping, um, you see this really qu clearly. Um, so I, like, if, like, worldly mapping is this incredible tool Essentially, what uh, um, Wardley Maps do is they break down any kind of product um, into components, um, placing them top to bottom from components that are closer to the end user to, com to components that are very far away, right? So um, think about uh, like a, a kettle, right, to, to boil water. The kettle would be at the top because that's what the user, the user is using. And you, you have the different components, like you have like the, the metal parts and the plastic and, and the plug and, and the, the, you know, the website to sell it, etc. And at the bottom, you have sort of like electricity and, and that kind of stuff, right? Um, and on the x-axis, it, um, it places every component in terms of their maturity, right? So you will see uh, components that are very mature and then the commodities are going to be uh, at the, on the right and uh, new stuff is going to be on the left. Um, and you can adopt, like use this model for pretty much anything. And it's like, uh, what's really interesting is you quickly start to see um, patterns of innovation. And one of the patterns that you see is um, innovation builds on top of something that stabilizes, right? And openness is a stabilizing factor. Right, a, a stabilizing accelerant, actually. Uh, openness is essentially commoditifies, uh, commoditizes things, right? Um, and so, yes, um, once something becomes sort of mainstream, um, then you can start building on it. And it's a, it's, a, it's a layered architecture, which is, you know, the layered architecture of software just works that way, et cetera. So, yes, absolutely, what you want is um, when things mature, innovation moves at the layer above, right? And you increasingly want stability and maintenance, and you certainly don't want innovation. Um, I, I've seen um, with some of, of my clients, like really painful things happen when folks are relying on um, things that they believe are stable, um, but that uh, are treated as innovation playgrounds by uh, maintainers. It's horrible. Right? And it happens all the time. I mean, it's part of the fact that we don't actually think about these. Things. We don't have like a mental model to think about these things. So I think that, you know, it's also helpful for this. So yes, absolutely. Innovation continues to happen, of course, but it's easier if there's stability underneath. It's like you have foundations. Yes. So you should, I might be showing bias in how I think of the maintainer. Um, 
um, you showed a picture of the project goes from early innovation to developer, then into maintainer. And I take from this that developers turn into maintainers. Maintainers who are reaching the innovator in a lot of these pictures. So your, your vision here of us having a group of maintainers, where do we find these maintainers? Because the experienced developers kind of expect it. Right? The developer who became a maintainer has probably become a more successful group. And they're also older and um, you know, it's not an easy to scale up group. How do you turn like a new grad into a maintainer? That's a great question. Um, No, but but um, but I think this is um, this is a great question, and I actually think it's it's an argument to the point I'm trying to make, right? Um, if you professionalize maintenance, right, um, then you start to have like things like well, you actually you have to define what the job is, right? Um, you have to uh, you have to build a career path, you have to build uh, education uh, for that job, right? But the education can be rather specific. Um, like you, you, it's it's not necessarily the same skill set for maintenance that you need uh, for innovation, right? Um, I'm, I, and, and again, like I'm I'm I don't think we're gonna get into a position where you know you come in, you innovate, you hand it off to someone, and you, you could do something else, right? It, like it, it never really happens that way. There's always sort of like very boundaries and etc. Right? But the way I you know the way I would answer your question is. Take the people that have turned into maintainers right now and that are educating um, others about how to do this, right? And 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 get them together to start structuring, uh, you know, syllabus and and like a career path and uh, uh, you know all, all the things that like sort of like formalizing the language and the um, you know and the practices that we have. And what's interesting is we're literally doing this right now because. Uh, governments are asking us to do this by legislating our the, the, the supply chain, the software supply chain, right? They're asking, okay, what are your security practices around maintenance, right? I mean, this is exactly the kind of things that we're uh, sort of, you know, uh, our arms are twisted to put on paper, and I think it's a really good thing that we do, right? So um, I'm not saying it's going to be an easy and, like, overnight process, um, but I think essentially much like we're uh, you know, training developers, junior developers today to focus on, you know, very specific things like a whole bunch of people are developers and the only thing that they know is React, right? Um, I mean, this is, you know, for old timers, this feels like a bad thing, right? But if you're looking at this from an industrialization perspective, it entirely makes sense, right? You're moving like the, you know, the, um, the person that's um, doing all of the things, into like a much more specialized role. And so I'm kind of seeing it that way. Um, not overnight, but uh, not only doable, I think necessary. A boot to you, it kind of comes by some DevOps in a way. Open source began with DevOps automatically there. It did everything. The industry went to a lot more DevOps happening. And if you're driving, actually, open source, you should have the ops and the, the dev not the same. Yeah. Analogizing. Yeah, no, yeah, you're right. No, that's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to go back to what oh. I mean, you know, um, realistically, what a lot of companies do do is they product reaches maturity and they move it out of the Western world into wherever they believe it can be maintained more cheaply. Um, and so, a lot of the MDNS sides, they do have practices that that's all they do. They, they take something and they become the maintainers of it and they do it at a cost that's lower than it would be in the West. The problem, I think, is that. Actually, to maintain software properly, you do need an expert, and the assumption is that anybody can do it but because it's not really developing, and it's not true. Yeah, I think um, um, there's a lot of um, interesting things to unpack here. Uh, I kind of thought you were saying that um, tongue in cheek at the beginning, um, and I know you said that. I'm, I'm serious. Um, I, I understand better uh, we, uh, like we, um, how you're thinking about this. Um, I'm not saying it's a good thing. No, no, no. Yeah, no, no. I, I, uh, yes, uh, it's a thing uh, for sure. Um, you know, I think it ties into what I was saying right before, which is um, I'm not like I don't in general, I don't believe the solution to uh, good software is um, like, uh, you know, 
putting uh, cheap, um, uh, un poorly trained uh, people on, uh, and, and I'm not saying this about uh, Indian software engineers, and just to be clear, right? Um, um, uh, like, I, I don't think the solution in general is this. So I think you're going to have some overlap um, and some working together, right? You're going to have, um, uh, you know, existing uh, open source developers um, um, being involved in that process, just m better supported in that process. So I, I, I think there's, there's always a concern of like, um, you know, poor software quality and, you know, outsourcing, uh, et cetera, but, but um, uh, that's not a necessity. That said, and to your point, to the other point that you're making, um, uh, organizations that have focused on maintenance uh, have built a whole bunch of practices um, uh, around compliance, et cetera, that we're just like really not there with, right? So, you know, it's like a, it's, it's not the same job again, right? Please, Chad. Could you bring up the slide where you have the plethora of roles in the maintainer sorry, in the paid side? Yes. On that one? And the developer? If I can find it. Yeah. Yeah, and one or two more. Yeah. Okay. So I work for a software company. And many people think that I work for software companies. And my company has people doing policy and sales and and marketing, you know, all the roles. My company has people doing security, my company has people doing maintenance, and my company has developers. So when I look at this, this to me looks like basically any software company. Yeah. And so my question is, at what point do our foundations, our open source software stewards, start to kind of evolve? into well that would be a really bad idea if you ask me <laughs> you know, what i would call like weird software companies you know all you need to do now is bring the developer into the kind of the economic the orbit What's that? the foundations put us up we push back and bring the developer into the company um i think part of the bill is probably going to be a fear like at their core volition they're like no okay so i mean we're at, we're at time i don't want to yeah, I'm, it's fine. I'm, I'm just I'm just gonna sit there for another. Well, stand there for another hour anyway. So you know, you're cool. <laughs> um, but um, you, you know, so there's another argument that um, is an interesting one. Um, if you look at the, um, which is uh, might be a little long winded, but I'm gonna tie it back to this. Um, if you look at the more recent security concerns that we've observed in open source. <clears throat> around social engineering, um, uh, XYZ utils, and what we had at the OpenJS Foundations, uh, Foundation uh, slightly after that. Um, what I learned in the process of dealing with this is um, that because of its unique structure that resembles corporations but isn't, mm -hmm. right, open source software doesn't have the equivalent of a, I think you call it SOC, I should know, uh, SOC, like a Security uh, uh, Operations Center, that uh, regular corporations have, right? Uh, and, and Security Operations Centers are uh, the ones that provide you with, uh, you know, uh, laptops and are monitoring the network and are dealing with things like social enge engineering attempts and that kind of stuff. Um, and the problem of not having this in open source is when something like that happens, and it now does, you actually don't really have anyone to turn to to get help and to get support to figure out what's going on. Um, the um, um, government agencies that, are, that um, deal with security um, aspects uh, are there to... Um, manage known vulnerabilities, they don't have the bandwidth, obviously, to go look at, nor do they have the practice or the habit to go do what is essentially, uh, uh, um, you know, an intelligence gathering um, and sort of like security as sort of like cyber security responses to what are, you know, essentially penetration attempts, right? Um, so, you know, there's, there's something really interesting to me in the fact that um, even from a security perspective, 
the fact that um, open source is kind of structured like um, regular a regular corporation, but not, right, uh, is actually a quite a challenging problem. Um, and so I, I kind of welcome and embrace uh, the idea of having, um, you know, this kind of um, corporations, uh, well, this, you know, this, uh, I don't know, like more, going to look more like uh, corporations. And I think that if you're really careful about separating, again, development and like the innovation aspect and maintenance, it actually probably is better um, so it's, I think it's going to get to, you're going to, you're going to have better outcomes, um, and um, 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 you by spelling things out by being more clear, um, not only are you going to get better outcomes, but you're going to avoid. And the, see, I'm, I'm finally looping the thing. You're going to avoid the risk of turning these organizations into sort of like weird nonprofit corporation um, uh, software uh, companies, right? Yeah. Well, because, I mean, it, yes, because if you're really like, and we're all concerned about killing, you know, killing the, the innovation engine, right? If you're very specific about what makes it, then it's like a lot easier to make sure that you don't. And I think, yeah, to your point, foundations are, are well aware that there is like, um, um, you know, uh, a danger zone here. But it's kind of like fuzzy right now. It's like the mythical unicorn that's, you know, two slides before. It's this, you know, this dude here. Right, and we want to move from that um, to uh, essentially uh, this. And now I'm going to rest. I'm sorry. I'm going to rest my voice three minutes and like figure out like the rest of the slides. Thank you.